Well, praise the Lord. We're going to pray. We're going to, we're going to pray. Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that you, Lord, would help me to present this word to your congregation. These are your people called by your name. Lord, it's your sheep. It's your flock. And it's your word. And, and, and Lord, I just pray that you would simply use me. I give you my mouth, Lord, to use tonight, to, this morning. I pray that you would take my mouth and that you would use me simply as a vessel. And I pray, Lord, that I would submit myself to you, Lord, and that you would flow, Lord God, according to your word, the way you want it said, what you want said. Lord, I pray that you would anoint it and that you would allow it to accomplish that which you are sending it forth to do. Lord, sometimes we'll see, we'll see results immediately right here in our mind as we're sitting here. Sometimes we won't see it till tomorrow. Sometimes we won't see it till next year. But Lord, your word is like a seed and it's being planted in the soil of our heart. We're believing you for a harvest, Lord, of yes. production of fruit in our life. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We ask you to have your way in Jesus' name. Okay. We Amen. 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 Let's read uh, Romans chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 15 through 17. I'm reading out of the NASB Bible. It says, but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, that's talking about Adam, the many died. In other words, Adam's sin caused everyone to die in, in sin. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. I titled my message this morning, A Tale of Two Kings. And the reason is, is because as we were reading, you can see the word reign being used on a couple of occasions. Death reigned, and then the gift of righteousness will, re will reign in life. Because of the transgression, death reigned as a king. That's, that's what the word reign means. It describes kings and it describes kingdom. Because of the transgression of one man and the way that that transgression or sin from Adam spread to all men, death has the power that it needs to reign as a monarch, to reign as a king in people's lives. But the gift of righteousness... Is not like the transgression. And it will reign in life. Death and life are being contrasted as kings and kingdoms. And the idea is that kings influence their kingdoms. In the realms of evil people, the people in bondage are under, are under bondage and tyranny. In other words, if you live in a kingdom where there's a king and he's evil, then you live under the tyranny and the bondage of that king. And it will ultimately it leads to death. I shared recently that back when we used to go to Cornerstone, they did ministry, missionary work in Jamaica. And they swear that when you fly from, from the border in an airplane over Jamaica and you get to Haiti, everything was dead. You went from green, lush to everything was dead and barren. And, you know, that, that, the, the religion of Haiti is voodoo. And, and, you know, the point being is, is that whenever the evil rule, then there's desolation and there's death. Speaking right, right. physically but also spiritually. Yes, sir. In the realms where the righteous rule, there is grace and there is life. These truths we read, these are New Testament realities about how God's kingdom operates. What we read in this passage, this is, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And when the Apostle Paul writes, I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of understanding about the differences in the types of biblical literature. When the Apostle Paul writes, it's called, this is called an epistle or a letter. But these types of writings are very doctrinal. The word doctrine means instruction. They give a lot of instruction about the kingdom of God and how it works and operates. 
The letters of Paul and Peter and John, these letters that they wrote to the churches, they give great insight and further clarification about the words that Jesus spoke. Certain things that Jesus said about the kingdom of God, he spoke in parables, and sometimes we don't really understand them, but when we go back to these letters and we begin to understand it from that perspective, they give us, they elucidate, they illuminate and give us a greater understanding of what the word of God is wanting us to see. And what the word of God wants you and I to see is that something happened in the spiritual realm. Yeah. I was talking to someone on the phone and you know, you, yesterday, and you can call it whatever you want. I've said it before, the fourth dimension. Well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a spiritual realm. Yep. I'm talking about the word of God says in the book of Ephesians that there are principalities and powers and that there's world rulers and that there's spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And you can't see those things with your physical eyes. But when you look at your checkbook sometime and you realize the choices that were made to make it look double, like my daddy used to say, double naught. Meaning two zeros. Or or whenever you look at, you know, listen, man, I, I've used this story. Sometimes I showed up at my sister's house at the age of 19 years old. I had hair down my back and some kind of pair of purple warm-ups that had some brown paint on them. And some kind of half tie-dyed purple sweatshirt with holes in it. And I was like, what, what's up, dude? I ain't had nothing. Holes in my shoes. And I don't even think I had socks on my feet. I'm like, what's happening? You all going to let me crash here tonight? She's like, we got church tonight. I'm like, well, that's exactly what I need tonight. I need church. Because I was tired. I was broke, busted, and disgusted. See, you might not have been able to see the spiritual realm and the effects that, had, that they had gripped me for, for several years by that point. But that was the end result. If I could have looked in a mirror and the Lord would have showed me what's going on. He was the enemy. I had been slowly and methodically stealing from me. Yeah. I had been living in his kingdom. I had been living under his rule. I had been embracing the ways of the world. I had been lied to by the enemy of my soul. And I had bought into the lie hook, line, and sinker because he told me that he had beautiful things to offer me. He told me that he had things that were going to just feel so, so good. And that if I would just come on over and play in the playground for a little while, I was going to have so much fun. But then the next thing you know, the gate locked. The gate locked and it wasn't like it was so beautiful anymore. Oh, I'm just coming up with all this stuff. It was like all of a sudden a bunch of bullies showed up. A bunch of bullies showed up that were bigger and stronger. And guess what? They started to have their way. And the next thing you know, I'm tattered and torn. Yeah, yeah. I don't have nothing left. But you see, you can't see the spiritual aspect of what's going on behind the scenes. And the enemy is having his way. But what this word says right here, it tells us in doctrinal detail that there's something that took place in the spiritual realm. And it all happened through Jesus. And it's all connected to what Jesus did when he died on the cross. We're going to break it down a little bit further as we continue to go. But what I need you to know to get started is this. Is that Jesus has already done the work that you needed him to do. Yeah, that's right. Jesus showed up and he took his righteousness and he offered it on the cross as a payment for the penalty of sin. Hallelujah. Not just so that you could go to heaven, my friend. But so that you could access the grace of God. So that you can access the presence of God. So that you can access the power of God. Because if you are born again this morning, then he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And that's the word that the Lord would want the world to know. The, that's the word that the, that the Lord desires so badly for his church to know. Yes. And the reason that he wants his people called by his name to know that is so that they can stand up. In the liberty and the freedom that Jesus paid such a high price, a ransom, through the shedding of his blood so that you and I can access the grace we need so that we can be empowered, amen, to do the work and the will of God. Yes, yes. If you've read your Bible or if you've watched preachers or if you've grown up in the church or if you've paid any attention at all, then you know what the Bible says. Now, you either believe in it or you're kind of like questioning it. Are you like, I'm um, just kind of here because I told somebody I told you this. But if you're believing it this morning, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's a big old world out there full of lost folk. Yeah. Now I'm talking about people that don't know Jesus. Yeah. 
See, they can sit here and they can say, they're gonna, pretty soon they're gonna shut me off. They, it's coming, even if it's not soon, it's coming soon because I'm not the kind of preacher that they want to allow on the airways because they don't want and what I, what I mean is even though I'm just like the small little guy that might be 15 people tuning in they don't care they don't want nobody else to know what I'm about to tell you see the world is is saying that it's okay for us to have a pluralistic society in other words we can have many gods we can have many gods and don't you start judging other people for what it is and I'm not judging anybody the Lord's the judge that's right that's right yeah. But all these other gods, according to the word of God, they're nothing but demons. That's right. Now, I mean, that's just the rapid version. Moses called them demons. The gods of Greece, the gods of Rome, all those things, that the gods of the Far East, every, whatever you want to call them, Buddha, Allah. We can give them all kinds of names, but they all, anything that is not God the Father. Oh, you're, no, 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 I'm here to tell you the word of the Lord. Hey, none of them gods died as a sacrifice. To pay the penalty of sin to free man from his sin. Jesus. Yes. 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 See, the wages of sin is death. But when Jesus died on the cross and he offered up his sinless life as the ransom, that sin, death had no right to hold him down. Death had no right to hold him down. He came busting up out the grave. Hallelujah. Because he didn't, he didn't die for his own sin. He died for your sin and he died for my sin. And that's a lot of the doctrinal concept that's coming out of this Romans passage. It talked about the gift. It talked about the transgression. It says the gift wasn't like the transgression. The transgression was the one sin of Adam again. That one sin of Adam spread throughout the human race. But because of the many transgressions that resulted from the one sin of Adam, which resulted in all of us being sinners and then all of us committing our own transgressions, God in his mercy and his grace to all of that, so he offered up one gift. Through, listen, I was thinking about this this morning when I was looking at it. Through, through the sin of one man, all men died. Through the death of one man, all men can live. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? It's a gift. And I want you to see that. But listen, in the meantime, as, as beautiful as that gift is and as true as everything that I'm going to tell you this morning is, you're still navigating life on a fallen earth. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What are you saying, preacher? Since the, falls are, since the earth's fallen, I can't walk in victory. No, I'm saying it completely not. I'm just trying to make you aware of what it is that you're dealing with. So as we talk about kings and kingdoms and a tale of two kings, I wanted to tell you that in the Old Testament, there's four books. And they basically kind of repeat the same kind of information. You got first, first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles. The Chronicles kind of like narrate the same information that's in the book of Kings. Now, during the book of Kings, now a little quick history of Israel. Uh, you know, well, let me, let me go ahead and use my groovy little thing. During the history of Israel... God, God called Abraham out, right? God called Abraham about 2000 BC. And then from there, you know, Abraham had, Abraham had a son named Jacob. And ultimately, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So that's where the nation of Israel came from. In other words, there was a time when there was no nation called Israel. Right? You know that. And then after the exodus, after the exodus, the people of God... That was, remember what that was? That was when God delivered them out of Egypt. You remember they had become slaves in Egypt for 400 years and God delivered them through the Red Sea and then they wandered in a wilderness for another 40 years. And then God brought them into the promised land, right? And then once they were in the promised land, that was the time frame of the judges, but then came the time frame of the kings. That's really where I wanted to bring you. I'm just trying to give you the fact that there's some history. There was about, there was about 400 years of the judges, and then there's about 500 years of the kings where we're about to start reading. So a lot of history. A lot of the history where the, where the people of God, I want you to know, have been confused. They're understanding God less and less instead of more and more. Because the word of God is being hidden from them. And I got to tell you, you know, before we even get started good, <laughs> that you need to be aware <laughs> that if you put the Bible on the back burner, if you tuck it under a shelf, if you leave it up on a shelf to collect dust, 
I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just letting you know that's my own story and my own walk with God. If you tuck that Bible away, it's hard to grow. It's hard to grow in your understanding of the things of God. So I just want to encourage you, even if you're just starting off with a little bit at a time, crack that book open, amen, and ask the Lord to reveal his heart to you through his word. So we're going to be looking at some stories. I started thinking about the concept of reigning, evil kings, good kings. And I, and I was like, Lord, give, give me a couple of kings as examples that we can kind of just use their story to describe what I'm trying to say. All right. And recently I preached, uh, Gabe preached Friday night on Ahab. But if you remember, I preached about three, four weeks ago on a Wednesday night about the spirit of Jezebel. You remember that? And we talked about the showdown that Elijah had with Ahab. So for my evil king and kingdom, I just want to quickly use Ahab as an example. And for my righteous king and kingdom, I want to use a young man named Josiah as my example of a righteous king. Now, one of the things that I want you to know about the time frame of the kings is this, is that there's a, there's a rapid succession of kings taking place. I'm talking about sometimes, if you, go, you, gotta, you almost can't even do it justice by trying to talk about it. You almost like need to put some earbuds in and listen to it. Because if you listen to it, you'll, you'll get the picture. Because it says, and this king died after two years, and another took his place. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then he died after eight years, and another king came up, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then another king, and then another king. And, and at the same time, you got the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And there's changes in kings up here, and there's changes in kings down here. And so there's like all of these kings, and it's boom, 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 boom. And most of the time it says, and they did evil in the sight of their Lord, in the sight of the Lord. They did did like other kings before them that did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then every now and then you'll get a blip on the radar and he reigned for 10 years and he followed after the ways of the yeah. Lord his God. And very seldom, two, three, four times it's sprinkled within. Mostly everybody's doing, doing it the wrong way. Mostly everybody's living like the world around them. Ooh, let's, let's go ahead and bring the world into the church, man. Let's get, hey, if it's good for them, it's good for me. Let's do this thing. Let's make this thing look like a party up in here. Let's go ahead and hit the strobe light. Let's go ahead and, you know, whatever, whatever, and making, making the church look like the world. It's good for them, it's good for us. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. When in Rome, do what the Romans do. And so after a period of time, it becomes so confusing because people don't even know what the Lord looks like anymore. Right, so. right, that's good. So in our first kingdom of evil, Ahab marries this woman named Jezebel. And I explained it a while back. But Jezebel was not a child of God. Jezebel's daddy was a king of Phoenicia. These people practiced the occult. They did weird stuff in their churches. They had, well, I'm just going to be honest with you, this is a PG-13 teaching. They, they had temple prostitutes. They had sex in their church services. Occultic worship is what they were doing. So Ahab, a king of Israel, marries this woman. And instead of him influencing her, come on church, help me out here. Dude, I done tried to wear myself out. I done blew all my bread out on my children. I'm like, oh, really? You're going to hang out with the world and you think you're not going to be affected? But you know what? You got to tell them. You better tell them. But you know what? Even more than just telling them repeatedly, tell them and pray. Yeah. Pray for your children. That's right. I mean, you need to pray probably more than you talk. But at the same time, we need to talk. The word of God says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Come out from among them, says the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, oh, but I don't want to seem weird. Dude, get weird for Jesus because Jesus surely did some things that didn't look normal for you. Uh, who cares what the world thinks about you, man? Did the world get, is the world really taking care of us? Nope. Man, look, when I was in the world, dude, I was doing it for the devil. As best I knew how. But you know what? Jesus changed me. Now I want to do it for the Lord. Because I know. I've changed kingdoms, my friend. I don't want to live under the evil and the tyranny of King Ahab's kingdom no more. I want to, I want to be translated, Colossians 1.13, from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And in this place where there is light and there is grace, I want to be empowered to do the work of the Lord and to live for Jesus and to have an impact so that in the end, like we were saying, 
we will hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We either believe it or we don't. Right. Come on, Christian. Yeah. We either believe it or we don't. And whenever we breathe our last breath here, we take our first breath there. Leonard Ravenhill said, this, this life right here is nothing but a dress rehearsal for eternity. What will we do with the son? Amen. And, and so he marries her. They served this false uh, Phoenician god named Baal. Her dad was wicked. Um, and, and Ahab allows wickedness become, to become the norm of the kingdom. It's normal now. The people are no longer really worshiping God. They say they are because they think they are. But they aren't. They call Baal Lord, but he's not Yahweh. He's not the same one that delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. He's not the same one that parted the Red Sea and the Jordan River. And all this results in that frog in the pot thing. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's like you don't even realize that the temperature is changing until it's too late. It's just a slow... Yeah, I think somebody, one of them newer Christian bands, are probably not that new, but, but wrote a song. It's a slow thing. It's a slow thing when you give yourself away. When black and white turn to gray. It's a slow thing. Sin always starts off as a little drop. Yep. Right? And even though I tell you this and you already know it, the enemy's going to try to bring a little drop of tincture to drop in your Diet Coke or whatever it is you're drinking. <laughs> he, he always starts off with a little drop because he, he wants to make it look not harmful. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Yep. It's just a little bit. <clears throat> Come on. But the problem is, is that when we willingly and knowingly sip a little bit of poison, it turns into a bigger problem. Yep. Yeah. You don't. I try to tell people that I love all the time, boo. You don't control sin. Sin controls you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you need to get out that kingdom, and you need to move into the right kingdom. You know, during this time frame of Ahab, sure, there was Elijah, and God did great things through Elijah, right? Elijah proved himself. Elijah proved the power of God. But then, uh, God, all of a sudden, God took Elijah up in a whirlwind. It's a type of the rapture of the church. Thank God that the Lord is going to pull his people out of here yes. whenever it's time for him to pull his people out of here. Yes. Amen? Amen? But then Elijah was gone, and Ahab and Jezebel died. And then, and then their son, Ahaziah. And you know what the word of God says? He came to power. And then he led Israel into evil just like his mom and dad did. And so generation after generation and king after king, childbirth after childbirth, life continuing in the midst of a kingdom that people are calling God, but it's not God. It's something completely different. Could you imagine if a child grew up, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you, when I first got saved, I got saved in that little church in Burbank. I told y'all about that. And last night we went to a service and all of a sudden, man, we were <coughs> singing some song in that service and some dude just took off. He just took off and he just started running. And I, and I tapped on, on somebody's shoulder and I'm like, he's like, you go, I'll go. And we always used to say that in the church when we went, hey, if you go, I'll go. If you go, I'll go. And sometimes I'm telling you, sometimes I feel like just take off and run around. And you know, it's okay. You can take off running if you want to. But what I'm trying to say is, is that at some point in time, dude, we when we felt that, and then and then when the so you fill it with joy, and then all of a sudden the worship music starts playing, and all of a sudden tears just start streaming down your eyes. Tears just start streaming down your eyes, man. You're in the presence of the Lord, you feel God dealing with your heart, and that's what it was like whenever I first got saved. <laughs> and then and then as time went on, all of a sudden something started changing. Now all of a sudden, whenever people are in the presence of the Lord. They're doing all kind of shaking and stuff. All kind of shaking going on. You got a whole lot of shaking going on. But not only that, next thing you know, in some videos, you watch people on the ground barking like dogs. And it, or they're rolling around on the ground in, in like laughter, like to the point where it's uncontrollable, like where they look like they're drunk. And the people are saying, oh, they're drunk in the Lord. And I'm like, but when I, but when I read the Bible, it says to be sober. Be sober, your adversary the devil, who runs around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't be in the dark because people sleep in the dark. People drink in the dark. Be children of the light so that you're prepared and awake. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that if you would have gotten saved way back when I got saved, you would have seen something happening in services 
where yes, people would be filled with joy and yes, they would just take off running and they over there proclaiming Jesus and excited for the Lord. But then also the worship music would come on and they start weeping under the presence of the Lord because like Isaiah said in chapter six, he said, he said, I saw the Lord seated on the throne and yes. the trail of his veil filled the temple with yes. glory and that the seraphim which were the angels they cried holy 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 is the lord and he said woe unto me for i am a man of unclean lips and i live amongst the people of unclean lips that's the prophet saying that he's unclean because listen when you get into the presence of the lord the lord reveals to you and i those things in our heart that aren't right but he's not there to beat you up he's not there to beat me up he's there to show us so that he can heal us so that he can make us whole and that's what you would have seen and then all of a sudden things are changing so just imagine in another 20 years what it looks like my point being is, is that generation after generation is growing up in the midst of this. They don't know no better. They got stuff going on in the, in the church, in the house of God, that looks completely different than what it was supposed to. But nobody really knows because generation after generation is being raised up in something. And you look at preachers that still try to hold on to the truth. Man, them people are old, dude. We do things so different, man. Them people not even relevant anymore. We got, man, we got this groovy light system. We got these new kind of songs. We got all this stuff, man. We got these preachers that are so cool looking, dude. That, you know, they, they, we, we got hipster churches. We got this kind of church. We got all this stuff going on. We got, you know, and, and but yet nobody knows really what's being said. Because they're missing something. So generation after generation, birth after birth, they're continuing to live in the midst of a kingdom that people are calling God, but it's not God. It's completely something else. And then suddenly God puts his hand on an eight-year-old little boy. His name was King Josiah. And, and listen, while they were working on the house of the Lord, they were doing some reconstruction to the house of the Lord. All of a sudden, they found something called the Book of Truth. Now, is that not the next thing? I want you to think about that. I wish I had my, I wish I had a physical Bible up here. But, but the point is, is that all of a sudden, they found it. What was it? <laughs> it was the Book of Truth, dude. It was the, the known Bible of what they had at that time. The compilation of the writings that they had that they would have caused their, their Bible. They're called their Bible. It was the word that God had given to his people Israel. All of the law, the, the prophets that had lived up until that time, the writings about the kings that had happened prior to that time. And they're over here going through the business of kingdom business. And all of a sudden, they can't find the book. You know, but now we found the book, right? And it's like a bunch of excitement. Hey, look, check this out. Found this book. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was the missing word that God has that provides light to expose lies and evil kingdoms. You know, the Bible doesn't really say how all this happened, but it does give us an idea about when it happened. Somewhere between the age of 8 and 26, a whole lot of stuff happened in the kingdom when Josiah was sitting on the throne. This is a possibility. I always like to preface when it's not, when I don't get it directly out of the Bible, because I'm over here, I'm, it's not like I'm not studying, it's not like I'm just making stuff up. I'm taking the whole of scripture, and I'm coming up with a thought in my mind, like this is more than likely how this happened. Like, for instance, reason with me for a moment. Humor me. When that, just because an eight-year-old kid becomes king, do you actually sit him on the throne and let him start barking orders right away? No. He's got servants and he's got teachers and tutors, and they train him up and they prepare him, right? Because, I mean, an eight-year-old kid can't tell you when to go to war not when to go to war. So he's got these servants that, I mean, we all know that. That's how that works. But think about it. For the last four to five hundred years, the, 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 the country has been deceived by false doctrine, false <laughs> prophets. They've been telling the people to worship Baal. So the people that I'm thinking are instructing him, at least this is how I imagine it in my mind, are not men of God. They're grooming him to continue business as usual. Telling him all of these things, right? And so he's being tutored by these people. And then one day the book is found. The book of truth. And it causes enough excitement. The word of God says that they started to read it to him. And so now I imagine in my mind, he's getting a couple of different lessons during the day. 
He's getting these false guys are coming in here and they're saying da 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 da. And then somebody else comes in and he says, the word of the book of truth, the king, let me read to you from the book. And so they start reading to him from the book. And this is going on for some period of time. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and this really happens, it's in the Bible. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the king stands up and he tears his clothes. He rips his clothes off of his body because he realizes that the very words that are being read to him on this page is what's happening out there in the land. That if you would go after false gods, that if you would erect their idols in your life, and listen to me, child of God, an idol is anything that takes the place of God in your life. It can be a relationship, it can be a drug, it can be an alcohol, it can be a plan to go do something you ain't supposed to do. It can be a false religion, it can be a car, it can be a house, it can be a job, it can be a paycheck, it can be anything that says, I stand between you and God and you will look to me and you will serve me and you will not serve your God. The land is full of idols and King Josiah sees it and he's like, my God, what's going on? It's like all of a sudden the word of the Lord was like illuminated in his heart and in his mind and his eyes opened up. And he's like, what has happened? Ah! And he rips his clothes off. You know what's interesting to me is sometimes preachers think that women ought to not be preachers of the gospel. I've even heard preachers that I respect. And they're like, well, a woman shouldn't be a preacher. And let, and let me not talk like that because it makes it look like I'm making fun of her. <laughs> a woman shouldn't be a preacher unless there's no men around. There ain't no men around, brother. I know they got men that are preaching the truth. That's not what I'm trying to say. They ain't got men like they, everybody ain't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And God used women to preach the gospel. And guess what? If they got men preaching the gospel and women, as long as we're preaching the gospel. That's right. Amen. Oh, if we can get the men right. But the men ain't right. <laughs> and I, the women ain't right either. Let's just get the person that's called by God to stand behind the sacred desk and proclaim the word of the Lord. They ain't got nothing but a bunch of false prophets in the land. But he got a woman prophet right here. And the king said, hey, go tell her what's going on. He, I mean, he, I guess he knew enough about his kingdom to know. That there was this woman in his kingdom. She's a prophetess. I'm a, I want you to read what she says. 2 Kings chapter 22. Verse 15. She said to them. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord. Behold I bring evil on this place. And on its inhabitants. Even all the words of the book. Which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me. And have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath burns against this place and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender. Look at that. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. I want to say something to you, church. I don't know what's going on in your life. I got a little idea of what's going on in some of the things in my life. Whether it be things going on with my own children that I love or whether it be things going on around me in the workplace or, or whether it be things, well, I don't know. What are you going through? But I want to get you to the place where your heart's right, where your head's right. We need to get our head right. What are you trying to say? Just like King Josiah opened up the word of God and he realized what was going on in the kingdom. When you and I open up the word of God, if we would just take it down and dust it off and start to open it up and allow it to get on the inside, we're going to start to realize that there's some things going on inside this kingdom right here. And it might cause us to come to the place where we would humble ourselves and where we would in desperation and yes, with emotionality. You know, listen, the children of Israel were very emotional people. I'm not, listen, I'm not just talking about emotion. Emotion can trick you. But at the same time, true repentance has some type of, a lot of times it has emotion connected to it. And they would, they would rip their clothes, they would take ashes and rub it in their head, and they would wail, and they'd cry out to the Lord. Because look, 
whenever we come to the realization that we're not right with God and the Holy Spirit deals with our heart, it's supposed to cause discomfort. It's supposed to make us aware that we've been against the Lord, but that God is good and it will humble ourselves. He'll heal us. We can't walk around here, you know, one of, one of my, uh, an old preacher that I used to sit on there used to say, my name is Jimmy, what's he going to give me? <laughs> we, we, our prayer life can't be, and it was meant to be a joke, because that's how our prayer life sounds. Oh, Lord, I need you to do this. Oh, Lord, I need you to do that. Oh, Lord, I need you. To, come on, Lord. Come on. Hey, my name is Jimmy. What you going to give me, Lord? You know, what you going to give me, Matt? <laughs> I done gave you everything you need. I sent my only begotten son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. To, to position you under grace so that you could be healed. So your land could be healed. So I could rise you up and so I could use you. Yes. But you won't pull out the book. I'm not talking to you. I know y'all are reading the book. But you won't pull out the book. Or pull out the book and open it up, read it, and let it. Or let's, I can't read. Okay, good, get it on audio. That's my favorite way to do it now. That's Stick right. it in here, buzz in, I just take off running. Oh, yeah, <laughs> look at this. Oh, yeah, the Lord's going to show King Ahab here in a second. Here it comes again. I listened to this this chapter 10 times yesterday running in the sun. Oh, yeah, go get it again. Come on, Josiah, because it's about to get good, my friend. It's about to get good. Because, listen, after this, Josiah starts to purge. See, the first time they read the book to him. The second time he got the book, he said, prophets, priests. See, around this time, now he's in his 20s. Oh, he's a man now. He's a man with the word of the Lord. He's equipped with the word of the Lord. Prophets, priests, meet me down in the corner of the house. I got something to talk to you. And he opened up the book and he began to read the book. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he starts to purge. <laughs> After he read, you know, sometimes there needs to be some purging in our lives. Yes, yes. Lord, clean us out. Clean start with the preacher. All my, all my false sense of this is okay and that's okay. No, 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 no. Your word is right. Yes. And everything that is, that's in me that's against your word, purge it out, Lord. Jo Josiah starts to purge. First thing he says, destroy the high places. See, on every hill, the word of God says in the Old Testament, on every hill they have backslidden against me. On every hill they commit adultery with those false gods. They were up there burning incense and they were practicing occultic worship. He said, destroy the high places where they burn incense to the false gods. Now, you ain't, you ain't ready for this. Take the Asherah poles out of the church. What? Take the Asherah poles out of the house of God. What you talking about, preacher? Asherah poles. It's the shape of a male genitalia. I'm just going to say it what it is, dude. It's the Bible. I didn't write it. It was the cult deity for the alternate of Baal. They done got so confused calling Baal the Lord that they done brought these things called groves or Asherah poles up into the house of the Lord. And they're worshiping these things. And Josiah's like, ah! Rip my clothes off. What is going on in the church? Right, right, right. And you know the person out there is like, man, this is a dramatic preacher. He's trying to act like all this stuff's going on in the church. We ain't got no poles up in our church. <clears throat> You'd be surprised what they got in churches nowadays. That's right. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Preach it. And even if it's not like a physical grove in the church, or one church I heard they might have had a pole in there, like, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> even if it's not that. It's the same spirit behind it. Do you know that the devil's slick, my friend? Did you not know that? The devil's slick and he just puts on a different costume. He reinvents himself. It's the same old tricks and the same old lies. He just puts on some different costume so that he can walk into the costume party and he can blend. See? But it's the same spirit behind it. It's the spirit of deception. It's the spirit of lies. The purpose of the spirit and the, and the lies is to move the people away from the truth, away from the word. If you put on, if just if you Google later, if you think about it, and you Google pre famous preachers that come against the concept of doctrine. Okay? You know the word doctrine? D-O-C-T-R-I-N-E. What does doctrine mean? It's instruction. The Apostle Paul told young Timothy, the pastor, pay close attention to the doctrine and yourself. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yeah. That sounds pretty important to me, my friend. 
coming out of the words of a man that spent time in prison writing letters for preaching the gospel, I'm thinking I kind of want to listen to you. But nevertheless, you put that little video on famous preachers coming against the concept of doctrine, and you will see them repeated. Famous people on TV. Doctrine, keep your doctrine. And all this other kind of stuff. No, because see, they got the word of the Lord hidden in a back room somewhere. And so when the word of the Lord is hidden in a back room. And it's not being read. And it's not being exposed. Everything goes. And all oh, this is the Lord, man. We got people falling. We're blowing on people. And they're falling. And they're shaking. And they're jerking. And they're barking. And they're drunk. And they're laughing. And it's all the Lord. And all this looks good. Or we just, we just keep a real calm spirit about us and the crowd is 10,000 people up in this church and everybody just keeps coming back. This is the Lord, man. This has got to be God. There's 10,000 people in the church. That, did you read your Bible? That's right. Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood and they all left. Right. Did you read yep. your Bible? Yep. You know what I'm saying? All I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to say if it's a big church that it's not the Lord. What I'm trying to say is just because it's a big church doesn't mean it's the Lord. That's right. right. He said, get those Asherah poles out of God's house and burn them. Grind them up. Once you burn them, grind them up and take the powder. Listen to this. Take the powder of its residue and sprinkle it over the graves of the people that wanted this. The people that willingly and happily participated in this false religion that they called God. Take those Asherah poles, burn them, grind them into powder and go sprinkle it over their graves. People are like, oh man, that, this guy's harsh. No, this guy's purging the land. And you and, you, and listen to me. You think that you think that the inhabitants of the land they confused right now. They don't know who's God. You think they ain't getting a wake up call? No, but they're like, well, what's he doing now? Well, it was bad enough. He pulled the poles out the church. And he, caught, he caught them on fire. How dare he? Who does he think he is? And like he got them chopping it up into powder. Now what's he gonna do? Well, he he walking over there to the tombs. Oh my gosh, they're sprinkling the powder on the on, that's that's Granny's grave. What is that? What are they doing? Put that powder. Listen, the Lord's not okay with his people worshiping false gods. That's right. Oh, that's right. And he wants the people to be wakened up. It gets even worse as you keep going. Proverbially speaking, they got male prostitutes parked in the back in the back parking lot behind the church. You think I'm playing? Go read it. It's in First Corinthians, Second Second Kings twenty two and twenty three. Sodomites, male prostitutes. Do that again. Second Kings twenty two and twenty three. Male prostitutes in the back of the house of God, because that's how they. Worship the false gods, but they were calling it the Lord. He's like, get rid of this. Get rid of the sodomites. Get rid of these male prostitutes. This is perversion. This is not the, the house of God. And then he goes on and he says this. Who allowed this? And the response was the false prophets. The kings before you were taught lies by false prophets, which caused the kings to lead the people in a false way. And then he says, where are they? Well, what are you talking about, King? A lot of those guys are dead. But well, okay, they're dead. Dig them up. What? <laughs> Exhume their bodies. You heard what I said. I'm not. I'm not stuttering over here. I'm not speaking Spanish. I'm not Espan. I play Espanol. Dig them up and exhume their bodies. What do, you want, what do you want us to do with them after that? I want you to take their bones and I want you to burn their bones on the altars that they use to burn sacrifices to the false gods. Come on. <laughs> then I want you to crush them bones in the powder. I want you to throw them in the brook Kidron. Dude, the people are tripping. <laughs> don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to tell you. Yeah. I know it's a, it sounds like a skateboarder dude, but people are definitely having a problem with this. Right, right. He said, you heard me. Dig it up and burn them. He's doing a purge. And so as I shift gears, and go back and teach for a moment on the tale of the two kings. It's important that we understand the similarities between our story in this passage. See, when sin is ruling, going back to Romans, when sin is ruling, the end result is spiritual death. The end result is spiritual death. The people of God are overwhelmed by sin. And the Bible tells us that the result of sin is guilt and condemnation. These are verdicts that lead to death. 
I know most of you have never been in a courtroom, but I've been in a courtroom because I was guilty of something. And it's not a comfortable feeling whenever you're guilty and you know that a verdict is about to be read over your life and there could be a sentence, maybe even a harsh sentence that's going to be uh, about to be passed out. And that's the end, that's the result of the transgression. The transgression resulted in guilt and, co and a verdict of condemnation that ultimately leads to death because in this case we're talking about spiritual death. And when sin has its way, death reigns. I want you to take a look with me again in verse 15 because I want you to know this, is that the free gift is not like the transgression. Amen? I want to say that again. The free gift is not like the transgression. Associated with the transgression or the sin of one man, Adam is the guilt and condemnation on all mankind. The power connected to that one act of sin produces a spiritual law of sin that controls and enslaves and causes people to live their lives in a state of, of worsening sin. And all the while, the devil whispers to people and he tells them, you're fine. You're still serving God. But sin and death are king, and sin and death speak a language of lies within their kingdom, causing people to believe the lies. And the longer they live there, the longer this goes on. The greater the deception, the greater the bondage of sin. That's what king sin does. Sin lies, promises wonderful things, beautiful things, but once people become citizens, king sin hides the truth. The word of God isn't open. It lies closed and dusty on a shelf. And the people go to churches and the preacher proclaims the word and they believe the word because it's their preacher. They trust him. But they don't know where the book is. So they can't open the book to read. So sin grows. And the result of death grows. Death to appearance. That's a sad thing. No? You wake up one day and you're 45 and you're 60. Death of appearance grows. Death to personality, I mean, dies. Death to finances, dies. Death to everything around. But the gift is different. Hallelujah, I want you to know. I know sometimes when I preach, I look at y'all, I'm like, dude, they're getting somber. It's like you really talk, you're, you're weighing them down. No, 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 no. The gift is different, church. I want you to know that. The gift is different than the transgression. I want to talk to you about that in a moment, but I will want to reiterate one last thing. About the lies of King Sin. You ready? Look at John chapter 8 verse 32. I think this is good for us to. I know I'm kind of long winded preacher. Just bear with me. <laughs> I'm trying to work on it. It doesn't look like it's working yet. But <laughs> just bear with me. Look at this. Amen. Thank you. Got three people that told me give me permission. Just bear with me. <laughs> verse 32. This is Jesus talking to the, to the Jews. And this is what Jesus tells them. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And what I, but this is my concept right here. We, we love God. And, but yet we've been, living in the, we've been kind of living in this place where, where we're being deceived a little bit. Right? And when we're deceived, we don't even realize how badly we're deceived. And I want to use these guys as an example. This is what they answered to him. Look at what, look at what these religious leaders answered to Jesus. And I'm going to help you out a little bit with the background because that's what I do. I study background. You ready? They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will come be free? Do you know anything about the history of Israel? I see some people laughing all day. It's like, really, dude? Are you even saying, who do you think you're talking to, man? You're talking to Jesus. He's the son of the living God. And you're going to sit here and tell him you ain't never been in bondage to no man? And in 726 B.C., Assyria took your northern kingdom and put y'all as slaves. Before that, you were slaves to Egypt. And then after that, the southern kingdom was slaves to Babylon. And then after that, Persia defeated Babylon and you became slaves to Persia. And then after that, Alexander the Great defeated to Persia and you became slaves to Greece and then right now as I speak to you you're under the dominion of Rome and you're going to sit here and you're going to tell me that you've never been a slave <laughs> see what the, see what deceit will do to you right right see what sin will do to you it'll deceive you say, oh no I'm okay I'm, I'm doing good I'm free I'm free man I'm all right no 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 you're not free 
You're living a life. The Lord wants to make you free. Yeah. He wants to make you free through the truth. Come on, somebody. Y'all got, we got to get home and we got to start cracking that book open. Not because we're earning something. Let me be clear on this. You don't read the Bible as though you're going to earn righteousness. If you do that, you frustrate the grace of God. You read the Bible to learn about the righteous one who loved you and died on the cross for your sin. And now you have access to grace. You read the word of God to learn of him and to learn of his ways and to understand what he did for you. Amen. Amen. That's why you read the word. Amen. Romans 5. I'm almost there. I promise. The gift is truth. The gift is Jesus. The gift is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would never die but have eternal life. The gift is righteousness. The text says the gift is righteousness. The gift is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Offering his righteous life as payment for ransom for our sin. The gift changes your citizenship. The gift moves you from one kingdom to another kingdom and allows you to live in a place where there is grace. Singers, musicians, y'all can come. We're about to close. We're going to close with a song. The altars are open. Once, hey, listen, once they start playing and I stand down here and I start worshiping the Lord, if you want to come to the front because you need, you need prayer or you just want to get in the presence of the Lord or you just want to stay right there and worship, but you also, I want you to know, service is also dismissed. If you've got somewhere to be, you know, you're, you're free to, to go. But listen, we're gonna, we'll just worship the Lord. And we'll just we'll go out of this place worshiping the Lord. Amen? Amen. Verse 16. The free gift arose from many transgressions. The free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. That's how I want to I close. With that word justification. See, what Jesus provided when he died on the cross was that he gave us his righteousness. That was really what happened on the cross, the great exchange. Thing. He took our guilt and he gave us the gift of his righteousness. And now that we have his righteousness, we can enter the presence of God. If we'll stay there every day, we can live in the presence of God. And his presence brings liberty and freedom and healing. And hope. And I just want to close with this last word. Justification. Yes. Because justification. Means the same thing as righteousness. If I had time to show you. I would show you in the Greek language. The two words only have one letter at the end. That's different. One starts in an O. The other one starts in an I. They're so close. Yet there's a slight difference. Righteousness is your position when you're a believer. What does that mean? I used to be born in sin in the world. I was in this king, this evil kingdom, but when I got saved, now I'm in a new kingdom. In this new kingdom, I'm in Christ. In Christ, I'm righteous in the eyes of God. But justification is the declaration of God that says so. I want you to know that, see, the enemy's going to whisper in your ear. The enemy's going to tell you that you're guilty. The enemy's going to tell you that you're unworthy. I got to tell you this morning, that's not what the word of God says about you. God's declaration over your life is that you're righteous. Because you put your faith in Jesus. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. And if you need prayer, please come to the altar. Thank you, Jesus.